what's the problem with caffeine? Why would people not want to drink it? And is it dangerous? So my glib little thought on caffeine is this. It is the world's most popular psychoactive drug. It is one of the most popular drugs full stop in the entire world. But I think the only one where you really have absolutely no idea how much you're taking. And, it's, and by the way, it's the only one which we routinely give to children as well. We'll give it to children. I mean, Bra <laughs> Brazil will give coffee to children in classrooms at like eight. And so... You Might know, help with learning. Yeah. They, they, they argue it really helps with maths. And I was like, I, I'm having an uncomfortable conversation on stage with someone at that point. So I'm like, I'm not going to go too deep into this, but okay. Um, so yeah, caffeine, it's ubiquitous. We don't know what we're, we're taking. Uh, and I think in the last five years in particular, the rise of like it or not, the wellness industry and the wearables industry, mm. I think in combination have probably made people conscious of their caffeine consumption in a different sort of way, right? I think we, we've sort of finally gotten around to having the conversation about sleep a little bit more of like, we probably Matthew weren't. Walker going on about right. you know, half-lives of caffeine and things like that. I think we're aware. Yeah. I, I don't think we're necessarily super well informed and that's not a, uh, that's, that's a sort of lack, lack of access to information rather than a sort of passiveness around it. But from my point of view, uh, you know, as I've gotten older, my relationship with caffeine has changed. I, I have to stop drinking caffeine earlier. I have to think about how much caffeine I'm having. And that's for, for sleep. For sleep, 100% yeah. for sleep. Um, and, you know, I, I am probably more informed and have more access to the information than anyone I know about how much caffeine I'm consuming day to day. I own a caffeine testing meter. So, I, you know, I, I, own a, I know a little bit more than most. But even then... I don't really know what I've taken. Mm. I don't, and that's nuts. Like mm. every bottle of alcohol must tell you exactly its percentage of alcohol. Uh, you can't buy a painkiller without knowing the milligram dosage. Every drug, by and large, outside of recreational drugs, but caffeine is not a recreational drug in the same way. It's regulated, it's legal, and yet we take unknown quantities of it. And so I feel like it's just due a reckoning is my feeling with it. Like I think caffeine is good and wonderful. I like to use it for its properties sometimes. Do you know what I mean? Like I, the idea of going to the gym pre-caffeine is unpleasant. Do you know yep. what I mean? Like I'd rather be post-caffeine given the choice. Yep. Um, so it's not that I'm anti-caffeine. Then you look at decaf and decaf historically has had a rough time. You know, I've come from a trade background in that I've seen how historically coffee shops treated decaf with disdain, frustration, resentment, I'm not, I'm not buying another grinder. Just sell it to me, ground. And you're like, no, and well, I'll forget it somewhere else then. And then- We even, used to do even, it in the little sachets. Right, classic, first, uh, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's no it's waste. a horrible process well, of putting the sachet, <laughs> little sachet open and pouring out this miserable packet yeah, of decaf of incorrectly that always ground. completely differently. Just garbage shots. <laughs> and poor decaf drinker, was, you know, I got to the point of like, oh wait, hang on, the people ordering decaf just like the taste of coffee and they're having the worst coffee experiences mm -hmm. by and large. What a miserable disconnection. That, that is sad, isn't it? Yeah. It's depressing. Yeah. And so I remember very clearly, um, I was in Stumptown in Portland in one of the cafes talking to one of the roasters, a guy called Joel, who's since started his own business. And, and we were chatting about roasting. It was 2007. And he's like, do you want an espresso? I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I drank the espresso. He's like, how was it? I was like, delicious. And he's like, that was decaf. And I was like, what now? And that for me was like, it, it was a very depressing cup of coffee because it took away any excuses for the idea that decaf could, should be disappointing. Yes, right? it's it doesn't, a new It doesn't benchmark. have to be. And you're like, yeah. oh no. And now, now I'm going to have to try a lot harder. Now, now I know that it can be good. And so, you know, when we started Square Mile from day zero, we're like, we need to make sure the decaf's good because that shot in Portland was such an eye opener for me of like, okay, it can be great. If you care about all of it, it can be really good. And so, um, yeah, I, I feel like the consumer expectation for decaf is very low. I'm aware that decaf's potential is actually surprisingly high. And so a, a lot about you know decaf for me in terms of YouTube videos, other stuff, is just trying to get people to be a little bit more open-minded to it. You could argue that I'm sort of seeing a, a future where caffeine becomes regulated or we really start thinking about it differently and there's a backlash against it. What happens to the coffee industry if we've only ever offered you decaf that is disgusting? Well, that's bad, mm. do you know what I mean? Mm. But if I can offer you an alternative that is well-sourced, well-roasted, delicious to drink and doesn't have the downsides, wonderful. Yeah. You know what I mean? This feels like, um, it feels like coffee's non-alc moment in a way. Yeah, yeah. And I think non-alcohol, you know, I think beer in particular, actually really only beer, I think has excelled at yeah. delivering 
a great experience. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't really, I, I keep looking uh, at sort of other narco categories. Yeah. But beer has done a great wine, job. Wine seems to be consistently dreadful. Um, beer is remarkably good to the mm -hmm. point where I actually often just prefer drinking non alk beer than, than yeah, alk same. beer. Spirits, well, that's a minefield. You know, there's there's some all right stuff, especially in the kind of Amaro territory. Sure. Um, They're just different products to yeah. me at that point. It's yeah. not it's not a like for like. The way the beers are like for like, and you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. You can sub out do the Narco of Guinness, and people are like, what now? And yeah. that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's really yeah, good. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It's impressive in that way. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah coffee can get close to where non-alcoholic beer is. Mm. I think it should therefore get close. Mm. And so, yeah, a lot about what I've been doing with it. I did a big decaf project, which was a mixture of education, which was let's go and see how decaf is actually done. You know, the world is scared of chemicals, despite the fact that everything is chemicals. And, and I, you know, like, water's a chemical. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so, I, you know, I kind of wanted to get into, like, what's, what's, what's genuinely scary, what's not? What's the health impact, what's not? How is this done? Is this safe? Is this whatever? Uh, and historically, actually, it was kind of good timing because decaf manufacturers for years and years just didn't care. They were busy. They were booked out. They had no public facing presence. You had no idea outside of one brand who decaffeinated coffee. And that was Swiss water. We're a bit more sort of, you know, uh, customer facing. But it was a closed industry. And I think I was lucky enough to be like, will you do this? And they were like, oh, you ask at a good time because we're thinking we probably should start doing this. So, yes, you can come in and, and you know, we got kind of unusual access. And then there's a tasting component where, very selfishly, I wanted to taste the same coffee decaffeinated different ways. Um, you can't just do that because it's all like four tons minimum run. Yeah. Uh, and that's like the little, little tanks. Yeah. And so, don't drink that much coffee. <laughs> I don't. And so in the end, I committed to buy, if necessary, 16 tons of coffee if no one else bought it. And then we, we kept some caffeinated and sent three to three different decaffeinators. Got you. And then we made that raw coffee available to other roasters so that, you know, roasters in the US could roast and sell these things and, and we could do kind of a global tasting and, and you could understand how big an impact the process has. And it's actually way less than you'd expect. Mm. You know what I mean? They, it, it, you can buy whichever decaf and you're not missing out as a result, as long as the coffee's good. So just run me through quickly mm. uh, the different process methods for decaffeination when this happens and, and let's say who's doing it. So all of the processes will follow a very similar pattern, which is you'll take your raw coffee, you'll steam it essentially to increase its moisture content and heat it up and kind of uh, make the caffeine in the center of the bean more accessible to the solvent. Then there'll be a solvent phase where you will steep the coffee beans in some sort of solvent. You'll then remove that solvent if necessary and you'll dry the coffee beans. And that's that. You, you, know, you can use different solvents. Uh, we looked at three processes. So we looked at um, a sort of a, a CO2-based process where basically you pressurize CO2 to, to liquid form and you use that as a solvent. And uh, it's really good because it's quite selective of caffeine and not of other things, but it's very slow. So that process takes like a week in the tank of like high pressure, reasonably high temperature, and that's just what that does. And then at the end of it, CO2 you can evaporate off and when it evaporates back to a gas it deposits its caffeine in the water that you bubble it through and you get a pretty easy caffeine liquid at the end which you can then concentrate and crystallize and sell uh, and then you've got your decaffeinated coffee. There's another process that's a bit faster, more like eight hours, uh, which is, is, uses a um, compound called ethyl acetate. That freaks people out the most. Uh, it helps, I think if you say it's like a uh, I think it's an ester of ethanol, booze, and acetic acid, vinegar. Mix them together in the middle, you know, you get them to hang out a little bit, and then, you, you know, it's a byproduct of um, sugarcane fermentation, yeah, so fermentation, we tend to see it. Yeah. Um, so it's often called the sugarcane process, because that sounds nicer than ethyl acetate. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sugarcane process. It's made from the grass. It's, it's really just nice sugar, cane. sugar. Sweet. It's, it's just <laughs> the molasses. Shh. Uh, but no, it, you know, it, I'm kind of pro, it's, it, you know, it's a naturally occurring compound. You'll find it in pears and apples. Like yeah. it just, it exists in nature. It's not a scary thing. You know, the dose makes the poison. Obviously, I wouldn't, you wouldn't choose to drink a glass of it. But that doesn't mean... There's a lethal dose of water. Right. You know? you know I mean? so. like, caffeine will kill you, you know, pretty easily too. <laughs> yeah. We're all enjoying that. Uh, and then the Swiss water process is slightly different. Because water will take everything. We know that because when you brew coffee, the water's taking everything. So what they do is they take an initial batch of coffee, soak it in hot water, take everything out, 
throw the coffee away, it's done. That water, they have a proprietary process to decaffeinate it using active carbon, which usually wouldn't attract caffeine, theirs does. So then you have water with everything but caffeine. Mm -hmm. So when you put green coffee into that, the caffeine moves, but nothing else does. Mm -hmm. And so then you keep that liquid turning, you keep decaffeinating that liquid, recirculating it. They can monitor like caffeine content live in the process. And at the end of that, you've decaffeinated the coffee, but not really taken much else out of it. Mm. That's that. So process-wise, they're actually very similar. You have to, you know, prep, solvent, dry. And one better than the other? What, no. What had, so they all produce pretty much the same result? They all... So we had like 60 different roasting companies roast these coffees, and we asked people what they thought about them. And there are trends in that data, but at the same time, the, the impact on flavor... Uh, amongst the 10, 12 kits I tasted was far bigger from the roast yeah. than it was from the raw, from the from the process. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like w what a roaster does to a coffee has a way bigger impact in terms of do I like it, do I not, mm. than you know the differences between those processes. Yeah. And so from my point of view, I, was, I felt pretty liberated. Like I like all of the processes. I would drink all of the, pro I wouldn't be like, oh, it's, it's you know, at the last day, oh, I couldn't drink that. Because I, I know it can be good. Mm. So for me, it's kind of liberating. I think that was the goal for me, for consumers, was that like it's okay if you prefer one of these, but understand that they're all, they're all good. Mm. It's all fine. And are we talking like hundred percent removal of caffeine? <laughs> <laughs> the language around this is slightly confusing, because um, decaf is coffee that is ninety nine point nine percent caffeine free. I think what's confusing about that is that that doesn't mean that of the, the caffeine that you started with, 99.9% .9 of it was removed. That isn't the case. Arabica coffee is 98 point whatever percent, zero, uh, caffeine free to start with. <laughs> Does that make sense? So it's taken down to barely any caffeine, but there is still a little bit of caffeine left. And so oh, yeah. if you pull a 18 gram dose of decaf as espresso, there might be 10 milligrams of caffeine in there maybe. Um, but that's not zero. So it's not zero, zero, zero. Mm. There's still a tiny amount left. But at that point, you know, you've gone from, say, 180 milligrams down to 10. Mm. It's a substantial reduction. Mm. It's a safe reduction. Uh, it's not a concerning amount of caffeine for really anyone to take. So it's safe and it's, it's decaffeinated, but it is not zero. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's probably worth highlighting now and again.